Through the ages, man has responded to the challenges created by the environment, our culture, and our economy. But the financial challenges facing each of us today are enhanced by an unforeseen hazard, time. Yes, with time you can accomplish almost any goal you set your mind on. But when time runs out, all of your plans may fall apart. Many of us make the assumption that time is forever. The plans of tomorrow are built on our ability to fulfill the expectations of today. However, time is not always on our side. And when you stop, often your plans stop. Fortunately, it doesn't have to be that way. When you stop, your financial world does not have to stop with you if you plan ahead. One of the most effective tools for protecting the future of those you love and care about is life insurance. However, most people do not really understand that life insurance is a mathematical science, not a game of chance. Hi, my name is Guy Baker, and I'm here today to talk to you about life insurance. You know, there are a lot of people who have misconceptions and myths about life insurance. And what we would like to do today is to help set for you an understanding and a concept about how life insurance works. And to do that, we've written a booklet called The Box. And the concept behind the box is to give you some vocabulary and some ideas that will help you understand the types of products that are available and how you might use them to best meet your needs. You know, life insurance is a difficult subject. But the one thing that everyone needs to realize is that it's mathematically sound. It's a mathematical science based on statistical evidence and statistical information that can be provided over a period of years to give you a very sound product. Before we begin, let's look at the four pricing factors that go into life insurance. The first one is mortality cost, and we're going to discuss that in depth here in a minute. Then there is persistency. How much of the business will stay on the book over a period of years? Then there are interest credits. And then finally, there's the expenses of running the business. Okay, let's assume for a second that we have 10 million 45-year-olds, all in good health, all capable of passing a physical. Now, we do not know who, but we do know how many will die from year to year. So let's assume in the first year that one out of every thousand will die. In 10 years, maybe it's two out of a thousand. At age 65, perhaps it's 25 out of a thousand all the way out to age 100, where we will be able to account for the entire 10 million. Now, how do you price insurance? Well, if we know that one out of 1,000 will die in the first year, and each of those thousands have a million dollars worth of insurance, then the question is, how much money do each of them have to put into the pot to have a million dollars at the end of the year to pay the one person who will die? Let's assume that that's $890. Now, at age 55, we know that two per thousand will die. And let's assume that that'll be $2,500 that would have to be deposited. And so on out to age 65, all the way out to age 100. Now, if you graph this chart over an extended period of time, this becomes the mortality cost, and it mirrors the mortality table. Notice on this chart that what happens is that the older a person gets, the more steep the curve becomes until it goes practically straight up. Now, what, what most people would ask is, what is the cost of owning life insurance? And there's no real way to be able to answer this question simply because we don't know when someone will die. So let's assume that they'll die at life expectancy. Now, you might ask the question, what is life expectancy? Well, life expectancy is that point in time where 50% of our 10 million people are dead and 50% of our 10 million people are still alive. That means that you have as much chance of living on one side of the line as you do of dying on the other. Now, if you were to add up all of the mortality costs, the 890, the 2500, the 7500, and so on, each and every year from today out to life expectancy, that would equal a certain percentage of the face amount. The question is, what is that percentage? Well, we have measured this for 20 of the major insurance companies throughout the United States, and we've looked at all of the different products that they have. And what we have determined is, is that this percentage is exactly the same, regardless of the product, regardless of the company. It's 74%. That's right, 
$740,000 to provide $1 million worth of coverage at life expectancy. That's the sum of the mortality cost from today out to that point. But remember, only 50% of the group is dead. That means 50% of the group is still alive. What's the probabilities of somebody living beyond age life expectancy? Well, if you go out to the first statistical break, which is the first standard deviation, that percentage goes up to 119%, where two-thirds of the group is now dead and one-third of the group is alive. That means to own $1 million worth of insurance, you would have to pay $1,190,000 in premium. Who could afford that? And worse still, if you lived into your 90s, which is where 95% of the group is now dead, and it's the second standard deviation, that percentage goes up to 240%, $2,400,000 to own that insurance. Well, no one could own their insurance. I mean, think about this for a second. You're at your life expectancy birthday. You're sitting down, you're having coffee, cookies with your wife, you're going through your mail, and all of a sudden you find your insurance premium from the life insurance company. You open it up, and to your amazement, it says $150,000. What are you going to do? Well, everybody says the same thing that I've asked that question. They tear it up in front of my eyes, or they wad it up, and they throw it away. Who could afford to pay a $150,000 premium? But let's change the scenario for just a second. Let's assume that you just came back from your oncologist and your oncologist told you you have six months to live. Now what would you do? Well, again, most people say they would pay the premium. Now that's called adverse selection. That's the one thing that insurance companies are most frightened of, is having a system that makes all the healthy people bail from the policy and all of the sick people stay. You think about this for a second. If you owned a life insurance company, and you had a system where all the healthy people would quit paying their premiums when the premium got too high, and all of the sick people would continue, what would happen to your company? Absolutely right. It would go bankrupt. And that's the problem with adverse selection. And in fact, that's exactly what happened to almost all of the insurance companies in the early 1800s. That's why if you check the history book, what you'll find is, is that most of the major carriers all started in 1828, 1832, 1834 because of this problem. So what are they going to do? Well, they called in the actuaries. Now, the actuaries are the, are the mathematical experts, the ones who calculate the rates and the probabilities of death. And what these mathematical experts, these actuaries did, was they got out their abacuses, put on their eye shades, and they figured how to solve the problem. And the solution is what we call the box. And that's what this booklet is all about, the box. What they did was they formed a container to hold money that could be pre-deposited. And so the question that they asked was, how much money needed to be put in the box and at what interest rate? Now, the interest rate would determine how much income the money would earn in the box over an extended period of time such that it could pay the mortality cost over their lifetime. Exactly. In other words, you can pre-fund that mortality cost over your lifetime by putting money in the box today. Now, there's a number of configurations that you can use. You can put the money in in one year, which would make the box very tall and very thin. Or you could put the money in over your lifetime, which would make the box very long and very flat. Or you could put it in in a stated number of years. 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, or whatever. Another aspect of the box, which you need to consider, is the fact that the box can change uh, configuration throughout the period of time. So if you start with a 10 or a 15 year configuration and you want to go flat over an extended period of time, then you can change to that. Whatever the assumptions are, you can change it. But the point is, is that you have to have enough money in the box, ultimately, to pay the curve. Otherwise, you'll have to pay it yourself. In other words, you can either pay the curve or you can fill box. It's your choice. But you know, life insurance is kind of interesting. And that is, is that while it's a mathematical science, it's 
totally dependent upon those four factors that we discussed earlier. What happens if interest rates go up? Do you think you'd have to put more money into the box or less money into the box? Well, if your answer was less money, that's exactly right. The box could get smaller because the interest earnings on the money will provide more than what was originally required, and as a result of that, you won't have to put as much money into it. But what if interest rates drop, which we've seen happen? Well, again, the box would have to change, and this time the box would have to get bigger. In other words, you'd have to put more money into the box because the interest earnings that were assumed won't be nearly as great. So the box becomes a dynamic vehicle, and it can get larger, and it can get smaller dependent on the interest environment that we live in. So one of the things that your agent has to do is to help you monitor the box and make sure that you have enough money going into the box at all times to meet your objectives. Remember, the box can be tall, it can be regular size, or it can be very flat, and you can change it at any time. But you have to make sure that there's enough money in the box on a year-to-year -year basis to be able to pay those mortality costs over your lifetime. So, what's the bottom line? If you want to own life insurance for the long run, then you're going to have to keep the box full. That's the bottom line. Well, we've had an opportunity to be able to understand the concepts of life insurance and the mathematical nature of life insurance. And the role of your agent is to help you design the best product to meet your needs over the long run. And more specifically, the role of your agent is to help you keep that box full so that it meets your needs and to be able to adjust the box in times when you may not be able to fill it up according to the pattern that you'd originally established. The box is an important concept, and it's one which will help you understand your life insurance needs in the future and exactly how your policy will work. I hope that this video has been helpful to you and that you'll be able to make the right decisions for your insurance needs in the future.